Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Hanging Out Right. Uh, we're really excited to have our two guests today, Ms. Shirley Spikes and Ms. Althea Steinberg from Virtual Studios. Hello, everyone. Um, let me give you a little background and then uh, if, and correct me if I get any of this information wrong, okay? Uh, Shirley Spikes. Spikes is a sound designer and audio engineer specializing in spatial audio and 360 degree immersive sound. She founded her company, Virtual Studios, after winning uh, Reality Virtually Hackathon, top 10 innovative ideas in 2017. She's an alumnus of Berkeley College of Music, uh, Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship, and a native of Jerusalem. Correct. And Althea Steinberg is a composer, performer, conductor, orchestrator, music technology specialist, and co-founder of Virtual Studios. Her aim is to utilize entertainment mediums to express the beauty of the world's people through art. A native of Johannesburg, South Africa. Althea right. studied <laughs> flute at Berkeley College of Music and I believe user mm -hmm. experience design at MIT. So welcome. As well as film scoring at Berkeley. Thank film you, scoring, wow, you guys are Yeah, amazing. writing music for movies <laughs> and games. It's great having you ladies on the show. It really is. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, this conversation. Uh, most uh, people nowadays in our, in our industry uh, are talking more or less about things that everybody's been talking about. Everybody asks the same questions. They all talk about where you came from, what you did, and the blah, blah, blah. But John and I, uh, we have always been interested in what people are doing outside of actually putting their hands on the instrument. Because that's what's counting nowadays. Uh, things are changing. They will never be the same. And uh, although I, I'm a bit older, uh, I still feel I love to play. Uh, I like it the way it was. However, I know that it's never going to be the same way. So in talking to, to people about things outside of actually playing, is very interesting to me, especially uh, virtual realities, which John has been into for years. <clears throat> so it's a pleasure having you ladies here. I'm looking forward to, uh, John's got a whole bunch of questions to ask. <laughs> so do I, but I'm pretty sure my questions will be answered. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm looking forward to experiencing a hands-on approach to, uh, what you, you know, to what you're doing. So John, go ahead and lay it out. And, yeah, I, I think the obvious first question is what madness inspired you to take on the challenge of developing a virtual reality symphony orchestra? Oof. Uh, I'll see you want to take this or I should take it? Yeah, on. yes. Um, so both Shirley and I um, are trained classically. So I started in front of a real orchestra. I was the assistant conductor to the um, East Rand's Youth Orchestra, and also um, I conducted the Johannesburg Symphony Orchestra. And so this is something that we really felt in our hands of like, this is what it feels like to be in front of an orchestra. And that is amazing. All of these brilliant musicians bringing their best, bringing their emotions, bringing all of what they've done before together, I'm sitting right there in front of you and say, okay, what now? <laughs> um, that's an amazing experience. And we wanted to give it to other people. To be able to conduct a symphony orchestra takes years and years of practice. You need to read the scores. You need to understand all of the instruments. Um, but also it's super expensive. Um, so both of those things really compelled us to help and to bring this amazing experience to the public. I think it was a very easy transition for so yeah. VR is a very very new technology it's like five mm -hmm. years in the hands of the public maybe eight years this is still something so new uh, and imagine if you were born in the time that people just started taking photos or creating movies in the cinema there's so many possibilities that for us <laughs> you know, seeing that new tool and saying hey I can use that new tool to show people or let people experience something that I like doing. So it was a very 
for us, it was, I think, a very raw idea. Like, we didn't even have to sit and, like, figure out what we're going to do with this. It was pretty obvious. Um, and I'm going to speak for myself. I don't know how Althea feel about this. But for me, working on emerging new technology that no one knows how to deal with, and there are no tutorials online of how to build stuff for, uh, is easier than just sitting and practicing my instrument. I don't know how, but for me, it's just, um, I like the challenge. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. It's kind of like a road. To try, road. yeah, <laughs> to but try I, new I, stuff, you know, like, this is innovative. Like, I tried yeah. this and maybe no one else has. <laughs> this is a playground with no rules yet. Yeah. We are creating the rules as we go. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so how did you guys end up at Berkeley Ice? Um, so I end up, so it started, uh, as you mentioned in 2017, I didn't even know that, Ber uh, that VR is going to be my career path. Uh, but accidentally I won a hackathon with a great project. Uh, it was back then I didn't know, but it was the <laughs> biggest air and VR hackathon in the world that is happening in Boston every year in MIT this year. They didn't do it because of COVID, unfortunately. Um, and I realized that, okay, my career is going some other directions and I started exploring and understanding AR and VR technology. And that's how I found Panos Panay who just started a new minor at Berkeley for creative entrepreneurship. Um, and they started with like a very basic class. They called it the startup lab, but I signed up for that. And apparently it was a VR class of how to tell stories and create experiences in VR by Lori Lante. Um, and that kind of like drove me into starting my own business, trying to bring something actually new and innovative to the world. And luckily I found Althea who is, who was already looking through the same path. Um, and we decided to collaborate on that. Althea, do you want to say something? Yeah. More? So I, I met Shirley at the, um, immersive technology lab at Berkeley. So we were both involved with Berkeley Ice, as John mentioned. Um, but we met in the lab and we were both teaching um, as peer trainers. And so I shared my project, she shared me her project. And we're like, huh, <laughs> we should collaborate. <laughs> like all of these ideas put together, that that would be great. Um, and yeah, so here we are. <laughs> what, was the, what do you think was the biggest challenge that you faced in putting this together? Uh, gear, definitely. Berkeley <laughs> uh, have partnered up with Apple. That means that all students are owning Mac computers. Uh, getting a PC inside Berkeley was not an easy task. Uh, getting the VR equipment. When I just got to Berkeley, they just started investing in VR. We had one headset for the entire school. Um, and no one knew how to use it. There, there are no tutorials <laughs> out there. There is no books <laughs> that people can refer you to in the library. It's a new yeah. realm that you kind of need to figure out on your own how to do it. And there are no professors that can help you or barely there were one or two. Um, yeah. Now We Left Berkeley was an actually a full program for air and VR technology. Uh, we have yeah. the ITL, which is the immersive tech lab that Althea and I started working in. Um, we got Berkeley XR, which is the student club running for AR and VR technology, so students can take their ideas and implement them in the virtual world. So I think we, wow. That's we left are. pretty good <laughs> yeah. Berkeley. Uh, and they are considering, well, it started before COVID. I don't know what is going on right now. Althea, maybe you know more than me. Yeah. Uh, but they ha there have been talks about a VR minor at Berkeley for people who want to pursue yeah. a career in virtual reality. At Berkeley NYC. I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> it's a lot of information, but you know, it's good to hear of the new things that are coming about for our industry because I know that things will never be the same. Not to say that they're going to be worse, uh, but my generation just going to have to try harder uh, to be involved if we still want to make money which is always important, making money. And there's a lot of trials and tribulations that yeah. we all go through. And I know that you ladies are going through them. Press on with a smile and do what you got to do with your world now. You know, I'm very interested. Yeah. You know, but whether I'm interested or not, you know, there are more of your age 
group people than mine. You know, which means you're gonna do what you do. <laughs> like we did what we did. You know what I'm saying? John, don't laugh. Yeah. I was getting there. So, I know, I know, I know. I'm in between, right? So so but but that's a, a, a real good transition to my next question. So for people interested in business, uh, what are some of the revenue streams you see coming down the pike in, in virtual reality? Besides hardware. Uh, we have hey, some, you want to take this one? Um, but in terms of rev in general for musicians, whenever people would come to the lab, the first thing they will say is, why, why does Berkeley invest in virtual reality? And I tell them, well, you're a singer, yes. Why not release your music in 360 and be one of the first pioneers? And then suddenly people are like, oh, that's an option. That's out there. Um, so um, as Chuck mentioned, the world keep expanding and building up. Uh, we are seeing more shows in virtual reality. We are seeing concerts in virtual reality. We are seeing musicians that want to uh, expand their abilities and try something new. Uh, for our platform, we did change it from being just a cool app that people can play with to a tool that people that allows people to present their music in a new and interactive way. So we are changing our pipeline to let other people add their music as well. Um, yeah. Connect to their to be, Yeah. Maybe to make, be more of a connector between artists and their audiences so to make them feel closer, to make them experience the music and really feel that they are part of it. So in VRSO, the player is really initiating the changes in the music. And so if you involve the composer and the player in such a unique way, that, that's not been known before. And so they feel the music and they feel part of that creative spirit of this is what it's like. So is it like, uh, I, I, I've seen the VRSO uh, yeah. video. And so, so it's Chuck, I don't know, should, it, should we play it? You can. You want, I'm, I'm going to play it just, just so the uh, <laughs> audience can kind of see what we're, we're so excited about. The first time I went on stage to conduct a full symphony orchestra was a moment I will remember for the rest of my life. I felt like dancing. I felt like I was creating a new kind of magic. VRSO is a virtual reality symphony orchestra. It's an immersive experience that allows the players to feel the magic that I felt when I was on stage in front of a full orchestra. You don't need any experience or prior knowledge, you just need to enjoy music. Using simple cues, the game will guide the player through fantastic symphonic pieces and let the player feel the music in their own hands. As the player progresses through the game, visual indicators appear based on the player's timing. Ice represents cueing too early. Fire, if the player is too late. Sparks, for giving the right cue. And stingers appear when player cues the wrong instrument. If the player cues an instrument at a wrong time, the music will get out of sync. Players can also adjust the volume of the orchestra to match the intensity of the piece. VRSO is not only fun to play, but simultaneously fun to watch, as the player can choose where they want to sit in our Grand Symphony Hall. They can always choose to see the game from the eyes of the player, but different seats have different perspectives and sound differently in terms of resonance and reverb. At the end of the piece, the player will be able to watch a recording of the piece they performed and of course share it with their friends and family. So you, you're positioning this as a game. So uh, we started as building this as a simulator for conductors and very 
like quickly moved into just giving people a simplified version of conducting a symphony orchestra, kind of like what Guitar Hero did for uh, rock music. Uh, the reason why is because we realized that uh, the amount of conductors in the world, is, it's a very small population, uh, but the amount of people that want to feel like a maestro or a maestra is much, much bigger. Uh, so we went on the bigger side. That's cool. Yeah. We also wanted to inspire the younger generation to listen to and feel classical music. So we're seeing a lot of decline, especially in like Western world and younger audiences going to classical concerts. Um, and so we thought that with VRSO, when it's fun, it's in, engaging and they really feel these instruments, then it would maybe just spark a little bit of the passion that we have. <laughs> and yeah, just bring people into the joy of it. So you... I know you studied or you played recorder most of your I did life. yeah I was a um, baroque recorder player um, I studied here in South Africa um, at the University of South Africa and then I went to Switzerland and Netherlands with Eric Basra from Verstegg yes. um, and so I won many competitions that way but yeah what really struck me is like the Mm, communication with the audience and just that feeling of engaging with other musicians and yeah I think in VR we have a little bit of a chance <laughs> to so be able to, to relate it. So tell me about studying uh, the recorder at Berkeley. I switched to flute before coming to Berkeley um, so I wanted to be in the middle of orchestras and with recorder that's a bit hard it's really soft um, and so I switched to flute, silver one that everyone knows. Um, also went a couple of competitions, played with, um, played for James Galway in one of his master classes, chose me. And so studying flute at Berkeley was really interesting. I had before only played mostly like Western music, um, some African music because I'm from here. Um, but when we got to Berkeley, it was really all of these different styles. I was in a, <laughs> like upper Middle Eastern um, band called Kantara. And so I got to play with amazing musicians um, from Israel. <laughs> um, and so just experiencing all of these different styles and how they come together, that was really amazing. That's wild. And, and one thing I didn't yeah. figure out is what Shirley, what was yeah. your principle? Uh, I played classical piano back in Israel. I was working with Yoron Gottfried and the Israeli uh, Symphony Orchestra and conducting also classical pieces. Uh, I was trained uh, in the Academy in Jerusalem as a classical piano player. So what got you guys involved in, I mean, see, the, the, I think, <laughs> and Chuck, I mean, you can jump in anytime. I, I, I hate to you know, just dominate the, the questions here, but I'm you're, really interested. You're doing great. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just interested in figuring out how two musicians who are primarily uh, have, their, have their foundations musically in the classical world, how they made the leap to the most cutting edge technology. <laughs> How do you, how do you, how do you sort of, how I'll do you say make it? one thing, uh, whenever I see everyone run towards one side, I'll run to the other side. Uh, so every time I see everyone going to classical, I'm going to go to jazz. Everyone does jazz. I'm going to go to rock. Everyone does rock. I'm going to find something else that is new. Um, so it's, you, you can say that it's avoiding competition or creating my own route to competition. Um, but yeah, for me, it's always about finding my own path to do things. So um, that's kind of what got me into VR in the first place. I saw that no one is doing this at Berkeley and I have like this new ground that no one wants to touch. That's where I'm going to go. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, I like that a whole lot. That's what John and I do. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> the director. Because somebody's going to do it if we don't do it. You know, if that's you right. guys don't do what you're doing, somebody else will because the idea is not dedicated to just you the idea is out there i always say how hard it is to be the best jazz player in the world and how easy it is to be the first jazz player in vr 
Just read the first <laughs> one. That's all it takes. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I think Chuck mm -hmm. can relate. I mean, uh, so like, because, you know, Chuck came up, you know, in, in sort of like the heyday of record labels running the studios and Chuck was on, I mean, I, I think his uh, all music guide listings like 18 pages long. It's like 2,800 albums you played on, dude. But you were one of the pioneers, right? So you got to do all the work. And you were like one of the first in there, you know, as, in terms of being a session player. So this kind of, you ever heard of the, the book, The Blue Ocean Strategies? Or the yeah. concept, the the concept, we, you know, blue ocean strategy. We, we talk about it a little bit in in the tune success, but it's the idea that you know, let's say I make golf clubs. I can make either golf clubs for people who play golf and compete with everybody else making golf clubs, or I can make golf clubs but target people who don't play golf because there are a lot more people who don't play golf. So if I can get them interested in playing golf, I, my audience is bigger. And because there's less competition, because, well, because there's less, you know, I can go into waters where there's a lot of competition and they call them red, you know, bloody water. Or, or I can go out to the blue ocean, which, it, which is virtually no competition, and then just go there and, and create a new market. You know, it's wide open for you, right? And so I'm looking at this VR thing, and, and I, I do hope that I can get one of you to explain, maybe give us for, for layman what VR is, and maybe what's the difference between virtual reality and augmented reality. But also, um, and, and, well, let me just start there, because I, have, I haven't touched <laughs> What's the difference okay. between AR and VR? What is VR? How would you define it? Yeah. So VR is putting people in a virtual world. So transporting you somewhere else, somewhere fantastical maybe, somewhere maybe a 360 photo of Paris, but it's putting you in a world that's not real. Whereas AR is bringing um, everything digital into the real. So putting objects on top of the real world that you see and that you're existing in. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the one. most simple example I think I can have. Um, Shirley, do you have a better one? Um, I, I kind of agree with what you said. So VR yeah. uses headsets that look usually like this one. And what it does mm -hmm. is that it blocks completely your entire field of view and putting you into a completely new place uh, that you haven't yeah. been in or it's trying to recreate reality. I usually like to say like virtual reality is not for simulating this room. It's for simulating and letting you explore things that you would never otherwise have the option yeah. to do. Going to space, mm -hmm. seeing dinosaurs, uh, conducting a symphony orchestra for many people. Um, where augmented reality, what we call AR, is layering another synthetic layer on the real world. So you still see the real world, you still see reality, it's just there is another layer that gives you either information or tries to tell you a story or tries to show you something that not quite be there. Uh, the best example we can give is probably Pokemon Go. This is the one that people yeah. are familiar with. Uh, the other example that people really like using is uh, the filters on Snapchat or Instagram mm -hmm. when it like puts another layer on your face. So you still see the face, but you see something else on it. Right. Wow, what uh, what made you choose to to play with VR as opposed to AR? Specifically for our game, because uh, firstly, I'm a firm believer of VR. I think that AR is still not there, uh, just because we need a phone to scan the reality. I think that once we have glasses that allow us to see in AR, it's really going to get a huge leap. Um, Facebook is working on it. Apple are working on it. I think there are a few other companies. Um, mm -hmm. Specifically, VR is because we wanted to give people an experience that otherwise they would never have. Uh, and changing their views, getting them into a full immersion is what we do as artists. We're trying to change 
the state of a person and get him to feel something different or to get him to react differently to a situation. And for us, VR was the perfect tool for it. It's good. It's good. Okay, well, do you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think you summed it up perfectly, Shirley. Um, once we have the, those glasses, then we can do some pretty interesting stuff as well. <laughs> I think nowadays they call it immersive and non-immersive AR. Yeah. So the non-immersive yeah. would be with your phone, immersive would be with a visor that sits on your face yeah. and adds another <laughs> layer. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, I, so I, I see you have the VRSO. What other applications do you see besides, you know, conducting the orchestra? orchestra i mean we see mm -hmm. you, you have a lot of classical music what what are your are you what do you have plans oh so wow have other... so many plans <laughs> i don't know what are we allowed to expose here um <laughs> that's true <laughs> don't don't give away anything that you, you know that that's you know <laughs> but do you want to include a lot of classical pieces as well as uh, yeah. original pieces. Althea already put one of her pieces into our game. So this is going to be mm -hmm. one of the first ever pieces that you're going to hear with a virtual yeah. reality symphony orchestra. Uh, other, other than that, we want to really give the story of the music. So we're going to add a bunch of Easter eggs, uh, which is for non-gamers. Those are like little hints that are hidden inside the game that are telling you a little yeah. bit about the piece, a little bit about who, who composed it, and a little bit about the story that the piece is trying to convey. Yeah. Um, in addition, I'm not sure if I should divulge this, but um, we really try to think about um, making education easy and fun. And so, as Shirley said, I, hiding little hints of mm, maybe parts of history or something interesting about a composer and putting that in VRSO and so people can experience it. It's not just a fact they read in a book, but it's like, oh, this is what it was like. Yeah, and, and I, I think this is really good for publishers, obviously, giving them a whole new uh, uh, a new life on their on their catalogs you know yeah. they have uh, 100%, uh, one of the routes that we want to take is uh talking to different licensing uh companies to try to bring mm -hmm. more and more content in so if you went to the film that like you went to the cinema or you watched a movie at home because we can't go to the cinema anymore um and you like something and then you can go and conduct the music from your favorite film you can conduct the music from your favorite video game but trying to like bring more content into people that are already fans of technology wow chuck you did yeah. a lot of you did a lot of recording you did movies for a long time i know uh you did you know from fritz the cat to mash to you know you you worked in big orchestras uh, I, I just wonder, like, you know, what it's like to walk onto a soundstage with 40 musicians with a big movie screen behind you or behind a conductor. And uh, like, you know, I, I think like Shirley was saying, I, I don't think I'll ever get that experience. I've done, you know, cartoon soundtracks and things like that. No but that's just me sitting in a room with the, with the producer. But you actually did it with these big like orchestras. I mean, do you think that would be fun to like cre recreate the sound stage and let somebody be the person like conducting MASH or the, the score to one, one of the movies we did or whatever? Well, yeah, I think it, it would be very interesting because um, no matter where, what level we are in our profession, there's always a pretense. We pretend to be doing something that we don't actually do. Uh, as far as um, being around 40 musicians in a full orchestra, to me, it's very, very, I'm trying to find the right word, because I probably won't. I'm having an old folk moment here. Uh, but just playing the bass and hearing the violins, the cellos, the brass, all that has a lot to do with me wanting to be there. Also to being very appreciative that I'm the one that chose to be there. Um, 
So I would think on a pretense level, you know, when I'm not there, actually, and say I'm at home, just thinking and pretending, I do wish that I could do this and do that, but it takes skill. Most arrangers are very skillful, ear, ear, ear skillful about where they place certain uh, sounds and, and, and moves rhythmically. Uh, so they do that. Whereas me as a player, I just follow. And of course, being a bass player, I'm a very strong support system if playing uh, the music that's written or even if I'm making it up. So I kind of think that um, at home, not being around the orchestra, it would be interesting to put, you call them goggles, or to put the, put the thing on and sort of pretend, you know, just to pretend because we all pretend. You know, that's why we're musicians. I pretended to play the bass before I played the bass. I pretended to play the guitar before I played the guitar. I pretended to play the trumpet before I played the trumpet. So now with this kind of equipment, it would be very interesting if I had the choice to pretend to do something that I know that I'm not gonna do. But you know, keeping in mind that musicians are musicians. So this is another job title that you guys are coming up with. It's another way of doing something that eases the mind and gives you comfort when you're by yourself. Because, you know, I guess no matter what, or what generation it is, it's rough out there. You have a lot of annoyances, a lot of interruptions in what you're doing. Whereas with something like this, you're not interrupted. Um, I guess you can, you can, people will find a way to interrupt you. While you <laughs> <laughs> but still, yeah. You're like in your own private place, pretending to do something that pleases you. And nowadays people are not being pleased as much as they should be. Unless it's a meditation or they're religious or whatever, but like people have a problem in being safe and being pleased in doing something that they enjoy. So this right here is, um, I think is great. I'm glad to be allowed to watch something like this begin. You know, because we hey, still... I had to jump in. I mean, just one more thing. I was just thinking about it. Maybe I, I think they might like to maybe hear 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 you tell a story about uh -oh. working in an orchestra mm -hmm. like that. I don't know. One of them, like like uh, I, I always love the Oliver Nelson story. That's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> well, you know, it's a great story. There's a lot that goes into the story because we all bring personal baggage, good baggage, maybe not so good when we come into a situation around other people. We bring a lot of things with us. And I was just new in Hollywood from New York um, with a New York kind of attitude, which is not negative, very, very good. But I never worked for Oliver and I had been in town long enough to have worked with everybody that had a name value. So when I got the call, for Oliver Nelson for a film, I think it was Cat Dancing. I think, no, it wasn't Cat Dancing. That's another story. Um, but I went into the studio and I saw most of the musicians there I didn't know I had worked with before. And then there were a few first call players that I hadn't met before, so I'm proud to be there. I'm new into been in town maybe a year, you know, and, um, there was a part of the music, a lot of music, the music was long, where we had to use maybe at least three music stands to spread it out rather than to worry about turning pages while we're playing. And there was a part, everything was notated, except for about maybe 14, maybe, maybe 18 or so bars where he just had a chord changers. Nothing was written. So my New York attitude in me at that time, I wanted the new guy, I want everybody to see that I was there. I raised my hand to ask a question. And I asked him, you haven't written anything here. What do you want me to play? And I mentioned you want me to walk, walk the bass, just four, 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 or blah, blah, blah. And he said in front of everybody, 
If we wanted somebody to walk, we would have hired Ray Brown. Hey everyone, my name is Jerry Robert and I'm the publisher at Black Card Books and I'm telling you, we have just published this book, The Tune of Success, Unmasking Your Genius, by two musical geniuses who have uh, played bass and played drums and contributed to lots of different albums, uh, uh, playing with Steely Dan, Quincy Jones, Aretha Franklin. I mean, these are two legends in the music industry and if you've ever wondered about how you break into the music industry and it's a business it goes well beyond just talent it's a business this book will help you do it and and there's no book like it and that's why we at black card books could not be happier to have published this book and if you are interested or you know somebody who's interested in the music business get yourself a copy and get them a copy right away guys we are all excited about this. We know this is going to become an international bestseller and it's going to help a lot of people go to the next level in the music business.